Christ. When Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Dear Lord, I give myself away, tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Brother Horton, we have a supper word prayer. Maybe see. It's wonderful to see each of you here today. Looking forward to a great day in God's house. We have a couple of announcements today. Um, Brother Fisher's daughter in law, Sheila Fisher, is having a hip replacement coming up, right? Sheila Fisher with a hip replacement. Sheila Fisher, she's having a hip replacement. Make sure we'll keep her in our prayers. Also, keep. Absolutely. We'll make sure we keep praying for her, that that will go well. Also, keep praying for Karen Pollitt. Um, of course, came through the surgery well. Hopefully, if she's not home already, is coming home soon. Please keep praying for her. Also, how's Diane doing today? We'll definitely continue to pray for her in the recovery time and the adjustment in her life. So please keep praying for each of these individuals. Also, keep praying for our church and the many things we have going on. Looking forward to having a great day in God's house. And we're very glad that you're here with us. Glad to have some visitors with us. Of course, Ashton's um, in-laws, very grateful to have you visiting with us today. So please continue to pray for each other. Pray for our God to continue to bless our church. And looking forward to a great day in his house. All right, hymn 243. 243. Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and fought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory, and I heard 
about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there a song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. All right, let's get our Sunday School Bible count, if you will. And then we'll take up our Sunday School offering as well. We'll be back in the book of Amos this morning. Amos chapter number 7. Amos chapter number 7. Now, we would normally suspect in Scripture. Instead, we find a man much like David that has a very different occupation. In fact, unlike David, who was a king... Amos really had no direct intercourse or any, any type of interaction with the spiritual realm of Israel in any way when it came to his job. He was simply a farmer, an entrepreneur from what we can tell, one who appears to have been engaged in several different agricultural endeavors. But God had a special mission for him. Most of the messages that he was given were all messages of judgment. And that's where we come into Amos chapter number 7, and God is going to elaborate on his judgment that he has for the northern tribes of Israel. So we're going to be looking at the hard decisions. Most of us have had some hard decisions to make. Many times these are decisions that there's no good answer. All the answers are bad. I remember years ago when I first went and changed my glasses, I'd been wearing glasses since I was, I think, in third grade. And I went to my eye doctor, and they gave me a test. And they say, okay, Mr. Stevenson, we're going to have to change your glasses again. We're going to switch you to trifocals now. I said, you know what? I don't really want trifocals. I'm okay. Thank you. They said, no, Mr. Stevenson, we are going to switch you to trifocals. They said, okay, let me put it this way. Either you lose your license or you wear trifocals. Which one do you want? I said, oh, trifocals sounds great. Why? It's all about the context that we put the question in. That's what we're going to find this morning. God is going to talk to Amos, and he's going to give Amos some bad decisions, some bad choices, but he's going to put them in context of what could be worse. And many times we look at God's ju judgmental hand and we think, you know what, God, isn't that a little harsh? Do we really want your judgment? And as God is going to explain to Amos and to the people of Israel very carefully that his judgment is actually an act of mercy. It could be so much worse. Most of us act in vindictive ways when we are offended. It's not a good trait, but it's one that's inherently human. We rarely seek for justice. We usually seek for ven vengeance. That is our natural state as human beings. It's not healthy. But any time we look around history, we find one group of persecuted people. When they finally gain power, they become worse than the people that persecuted them. It is normal for human beings. Sad, but normal. God's not that way. God is going to show us through this lesson that he gives us in Amos 7 that his acts of judgment are always acts of mercy. He does not act like we do, getting, getting ours and then some. Instead, he acts in an act of love where he holds his judgment back so that we have a chance to come back to him. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your goodness and your love to us. Lord, we ask you to work in our hearts this morning. Help us to be drawn closer to you. Lord, help us to see both your justice in this passage as well as the fact that you have great love and mercy for us. Lord, we ask you to draw us closer to, us, closer to you. Forgive us for our many failings, Lord. Help our church, Lord. Help us to be more of what you want us to be. We thank you for this message you've given us to this morning. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. 
We're going to start off in verse number one. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth, and lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. Now, this is extremely important because Amos is a farmer. He understands many things that you and I don't. We all, most of us, dabble with gardens. We like to grow a few things. Maybe you grow some flowers. Maybe you simply try to endeavor to grow grass in your yard during the summer here. Maybe you grow a vegetable garden. It's what I do. I don't really care about grass so much. Flowers really don't do anything for me. My wife has some, but I don't really mess with them. It would not offend me if they all died. It just doesn't bother me. But I do care about my vegetables. But here, Amos has a much deeper understanding than simply a vegetable garden. He understands the essential nature of agriculture to any society, especially to his. Here in our country, we are so far removed from our agricultural system that we rarely understand how necessary it is. Now, recently, if you've been going to the grocery store, you probably have seen some changes. That happens, especially in a time when our inflation is questionable. Maybe you all of a sudden started looking at those steaks and decided that, you know, hamburger looks real good right about now. Or maybe you're looking at hamburger and all of a sudden hot dogs sound good. Or whatever, you happen, whatever decisions you happen to be making. Well, Amos understands this extremely well. He understands that to his country, agriculture is everything. And so the first judgment that God gives him, the first of the visions we're going to look at today, is a terrifying one. So let's look at his visions. First of all, he looks at the famine that God promises. Thus saith the Lord God, thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers. Now many times we don't think of grasshoppers or locusts as being that big of a deal. For me in my garden, I don't like aphids. I don't like things, I don't like the, all the different worms that like to eat my tomatoes. I don't hate cabbage worms that eat my kale. But we understand here the greatest threat to the people in Israel and this part of the world were the locusts. They would eat everything. In fact, many times, and even now in Africa and certain parts of the Middle East, locusts are feared more than almost anything else. And that's even with the developed countries providing aid when necessary. So all of a sudden he says that he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth. Let's look at where this growth is being targeted. Here in biblical days, the, the custom was that the king had first dibs on the, any growth, any of the produce that came into the, into the agricultural realm. For example, it says, and lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. So the idea is whenever the king first gathered in all the fruit, all the first crop that you grew was your taxes. Everything that went to the government to fund whatever the government was doing probably squandering it like they do today. That's just the way of governments. But that was what the first mowing was reserved for. Here in, here in Florida, we typically have more than one growing season. Maybe you get two crops of tomatoes, one in the spring and one in the fall, or whatever you're growing. Same idea was here. So this is the idea of after the king has collected everything for himself and probably squandered it, then it was when the shooting up of the second growth, the beginning of it, the last growth before the winter set in. This was devastating to any people. This was the idea that the people would not have anything to eat. It would totally destroy an economy, especially one rooted on agriculture. This would, of course, lead to riots. It would lead to famine. It would lead to malnutrition. It would lead to rickets. It would lead to people starving to death. It would lead to violence. Amos understood all of this. He had probably seen people in, t in desperate times, desperate for food. After all, he's a farmer. This is his area of expertise. And he says, the locusts are coming in at the springing up. What does it say here? It was the shooting up of the latter growth. And I know it was the latter growth after the king's mowing. In verse number two, the Bible says, And it came to pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the land, then I said, O oh Lord God, forgive I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise, for he is small? Amos says, God, there's no way. You're eating up all the grazing land in, in our land. You're eating up everything. There is nothing left for our, for our animals. There's nothing left for us. There's no grain left. Everybody and everything starves. He says, God, we can't do this. Everyone in your kingdom will suffer. This is an indiscriminate punishment. Everyone goes down together. The innocent with the guilty. And what does he say? 
It says, O oh Lord God, forgive. I beseech thee, it's the idea of begging. By whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. He's going to say this two times in this passage. He says, Jacob is incapable of surviving such an onslaught. It's incapable. We're going to look at this a little deeper in a moment. He says, for whom shall Jacob arise? God, you're not going to leave us a remnant. This will destroy us. We will all die as a nation. Remember, we are your people. It says, Jacob, the one you promised to protect, the name for the northern tribes of Israel. It says, Jacob, you promised him that you would make him, make him a great nation. You promised him that you would not reject him. But God, if you do this, Jacob will never arise again. He'll be done for. He can't survive a famine of this degree. Look at verse number three. The Lord repented for this. It shall not be, saith the Lord. Now recall that God knows all. He knows what's happening. In my opinion, I think he's a lot like my eye doctor, saying, Mr. Stevenson, we'll take your license if we don't do something else. I believe that's what God is giving us here. He's telling Amos, it could be worse. I want you to see my love in the judgment that's coming. So God says, I repent. I change my mind. It's not the idea of God turning away from wickedness. It's the idea of God changing his mind. It says, the Lord repented for this. It shall not be, saith the Lord. God says, okay, that's not the judgment. Let me give you another choice, Amos. Verse number three. Verse number four. Thus saith the Lord God, Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, the Lord called to contend by fire, and it devoured the great deep, and it did eat up a part. What are the greatest natural disasters that you're afraid of? I would assume it's not hurricanes, because you live here. More than likely, for most of us, it's volcanoes. Maybe it's the idea of any type of geothermal, or any type of ge geological changes in our land. Maybe it's an earthquake, a volcano. Those are all pretty terrifying to me. After we moved here, Rebecca was trying to get the idea that, you know, there are some things worse than hurricanes. And she pointed out West and says, you know what, they had forest fires. At least we don't have forest fires here until last summer, of course. And then all of a sudden we started, you know, that fire is only about a couple miles from our house. That's getting pretty close. The idea here is this is a fire of, of devastating proportions. Because it's going to eat up the entire region. Remember, here in Florida, we have some fire breaks. But out West, what do they have? Can you imagine some of their fires if they had, did not have the fire equipment that they do now? Can you imagine how devastating? Of course, some actually suppose that possibly it would not be as bad because the fires would burn more frequently and with less intensity. But God is saying here, no, the fire I'm sending will be severe. I will destroy you by a natural disaster that you've never seen before. It says in verse number four, the Lord God called to contend by fire, and it devoured the great deep, and did eat up a part. It says, even the water supply that you have now will, be dis will disappear. Everything will be gone. I'll eat up your agricultural land. I'll destroy your houses. I'll destroy everything by fire. And Amos also understands this is not a good option. He'll go on in verse number five. Then said I, O Lord God, cease, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise, for he is small. See, Amos understands something that evidently the people of the northern tribes of Israel did not. Jacob was not a mighty nation. They thought they were. They thought they had all the power they needed. After all, they were one of the powerhouses of that region of the world. But, God says, but Amos says, God, I know that we're not that powerful. Many times, many planners, especially when you look at some of the FEMA um, individuals and some of the, what they look at, they realize that if too many natural disasters happen at once, all of a sudden a region cannot actually recover. Imagine here in Florida, if we had three or four hurricanes hit at the same time, what would that do to us? Well, we look around and we understand that when something comes through here, all the power trucks from all the region come here to help because they're big enough to actually supply help to one area that's devastated. But when you have multiple areas, a region just isn't big enough to be able to get over that easily. Here he is saying, Amos is saying, God, Israel's not big enough to be able to recover from a devastating fire. He is small. He is not big enough to overcome from a devastating famine. Everyone will suffer, God. God, there will not be a remnant left. It says, by whom shall Jacob arise? 
God, Jacob will never come back. God, if you do it this way, there is nothing left of Jacob. Everything will be devastated. We have no chance. We have no chance of arising. You promised that Jacob would always be. That God, you promised that Israel and the people of Israel will always come to every generation. That there will always be your Messiah. Your Messiah is coming through the people of Israel, God. You can't destroy us all. And God says, okay, Amos, I've given you two natural disasters. And you've said both of them are too bad. And God says, I understand that. They are. So let me give you the third option. It's a very unpleasant option, and it's not natural. It is man-made. But it's one that I'm going to give you as devastating and as horrific as it will be. It'll be one that's out of mercy because I'm going to make sure Jacob can arise. I'm going to make sure that Jacob can turn around his actions. He says, I am not a vindictive God that's coming down to squash you. I'm simply trying to bring you back to me. Therefore, I need Jacob to arise and to turn back to me. Because my son will one day come through this same area in Galilee, and he'll be preaching to these same individuals. He'll be preaching to the people of Judah, the people of Jacob. He'll be preaching to each of these individuals. And he'll be my Messiah for all ages. He says, I need him here. That's why I'm going to send this last judgment to you. It will not be an indiscriminate judgment, as we'll see in a moment. But it's going to be one that's going to be very well defined. As devastating as it'll be, it'll still be an act of my mercy because I will leave room for repentance. So he comes down in verse number six. The Lord repented for this. This also shall not be, saith the Lord God. He says, now let me explain to you what I actually am going to do. I've showed you the other alternatives. Now let me show you what is happening. Verse number seven. Thus he showed me. And behold, the Lord God, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of, of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be made, laid waste. And I, will not, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword." So here he's saying, you know what, I'm actually going to judge you. I'm going to judge you using foreign nations to come in and dominate and destroy your country. But I'm going to do it like a plumb line. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a plumb line before. I assume some of you have used one before. My dad used to have a really fancy plumb line. Uh, I think it was made actually of, of course, plum. It was a plumb line, so it was actually made of lead. But it's interesting, the history of the plumb line goes way farther back than that. I don't have a fancy plumb line. And said what I do, I recently got one of these laser levels that levels it for you. And basically, it's the modern version of the plumb line. I'm just a little lazy, and I need a little help. So I need something that I, does not depend on any point in my house. Something that will be level no matter what it touches. That's one of the big benefits of a laser level or a plumb line over any other type of level. is the fact that it will be level, barring a few circumstances, of course. The, the plumb line comes back from ancient Egypt, from what I understand. And the idea of the plumb line was, basically, it was a rock attached to a stone. I didn't grab a rock. Thumbnails. But basically, all it is, it is some sort of weight at the end of the line. The idea is, barring, of course, any type of changes on mag mag magnetism, basically, the plumb line will always be strong. It will always give you a nice strong. Line up. The image we're given is God standing on top of a mountain. God is standing on top of a mountain. And as he's standing there, yes, I'm sorry for everyone online. I forgot to turn on my mic today. So God is standing on top of this wall. And he says, let me show you. This plumb line will always be straight. It will always be a sure measurement. No matter whether this wall is straight or not, no matter anything else, the plumb line will be straight. And God says, that's exactly what I'm going to do to Israel. I'm going to define Israel, whether or not Israel is in my law. It's interesting, one of the terms in the New Testament for unrighteousness is, comes from the idea of being outside of God's box, outside of God's plumb line. And God says, I'm going to come to Israel, and I'm going to measure Israel based on my standards. If you take a plumb line into my house, you know what you'll find? You'll find there's nothing straight in my house. In fact, when I set up my laser level to put up my tile in my bathroom, I suddenly realized, hmm, my tile might be straight because I used a laser level, but it will always look wrong 
because the house's walls are wrong, and the roof is wrong, and the floor is wrong. God is saying the same thing happens to Israel. He says, I'm going to come in, and I'm going to bring my plumb line to your country. I'm going to bring my plumb line to your houses of righteousness, and it will look wrong because everything is wrong in your nation. It's interesting, if we look out in our own country, in our own society, many times we take God's word into the rest of the world, it looks like God's word is out of plumb. It simply isn't there. It simply doesn't make sense. God's word is not righteous anymore. But what is the issue? The issue is the entire house is, is crooked and wobbly. Therefore, God's word will never look right, because God's word is right and the entire house is wrong. God says, I'm going to bring this plumb line, and I'm going to see who is righteous and who is not. Says, My, this time, unlike all the, other, all the other things we've done, this time, I'm going to make sure that this is not an indiscriminate punishment. Instead, I'm going to measure everyone based upon what they've done. In fact, there will be some people who suffer when it comes to the, the southern kingdom of Judah. They will suffer because of other people's disobedience, but we'll find that they always have God's grace with them. Recall with me Daniel. He was taken captive in one of the first captivities of the southern tribes. But what did God tell him? God made sure that Daniel, no matter what happened in his life, God was always there for him. See, God's, God's punishment is not indiscriminate. God is simply coming to correct the wall, not to destroy it. God says, yes, there will be a lot of negative things that happen to your country, but they're not going to be like the fam that wipes out the country. It's not going to be the fire that leaves nothing behind. It says, my plumb line is coming to set things straight. Now, there will be a great deal of destruction that has to happen because of this plumb line. Just like whenever you get something out of, out of square whenever you're building something. Sometimes you have to take it down and put it back up. Sometimes you have to put a wedge in. Sometimes you have to destroy it. But God says, the end result is my repair work. It is setting things straight and level that I'm coming to do. He says in verse number, verse number 9, And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. God says, I am going to have to do some destruction here. But remember, it could be worse. I'm coming to set it straight, not simply to destroy. Recall, of course, when we come to Jesus' own words in the, in the New Testament, he makes it very clear, I'm not come to destroy, I'm come to heal. The same message is here. God says, yes, there is some negative punishment, but it's all for the point of restoring Israel, that Jacob might arise. I believe the principle in our lives is very clear. Whether we're giving the message to others or whether we're applying it to ourselves, God is trying to restore, not to destroy. Many times in our own culture, because we are vindictive human beings, we like to bring that into our religion. We find all throughout history, many different religions have sought to persecute each other and destroy each other. And unfortunately, even some so-called Christians did the same. But that is not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is always one of restoration, and one of peace, and one of making sure people are restored to God, not destroyed. Despite, of course, the destruction that does come. So anyways, this is the message that we're given. We're giving these great visions. We're told again, if you remember back to the Cold War era, that God's plans are not like the Russian nuclear plan. What did they have? They had lots of very large nuclear devices that were, de they're, they're, they were not necessarily de designed to be precise, but rather just level everything. Whereas American nuclear designs were much smaller, but they were designed to be much more precise. God says, my judgment is precise. He says, I'm coming to set things right, not simply to destroy. He says, my coming punishment, it will not be the famine, it will not be the fire, it will be violence, but it will be within my bounds. So these are the visions that are given. Unfortunately, despite the beauty of the fact that God shows his mercy in these judgments, there is always some resistance to the message of God. It's interesting where this resistance sometimes comes from. We would suspect it would come from the world, those in the greatest and gravest and darkest of sins. But that's not always the case. Here we see in, this, in the verse number 10, the Bible says, Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. So we see the priest of Bethel. 
Of course, of course, remember in, in the Old Testament, at this time, there were two main places of worship, Bethel and then, of course, Jerusalem. Because the nations were separated, they did worship in separate areas. But despite this, you would expect Amaziah, despite his separation from Jerusalem, to still be focused on the things of God. Well, that's just not the case. He says, I don't like the idea of Amos, this country preacher, this part-time lay preacher coming and telling me what to do. So he does two actions. The first one is he tries the political route. He's going to try to get Amos thrown out of the country. After all, Amos comes from Jerusalem or from Judah, so maybe he'll go back home there. Let me start up some rumors, some conspiracies. Let me make sure everyone understands there's some intrigue about Amos, that he is here to, to sow discord. So he writes to the king. And what is the king's greatest fear? Losing power. And so Amaziah knows this. So he writes to the king and says, Amos hath conspired against thee. In the midst of the house of Israel, the land is not able to bear his words. As God, excuse me, Jeroboam, he's coming and he's going to start a revolution. He is going to turn everyone against you. The land will crumble. We will not have a continuity of government here. You have to get rid of Amos. Verse number 11, For thus Amos saith, and this is half true. There's a little bit of truth in this, but not, as, not exactly the way Amaziah says it. Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall be surely led away captive out of, it, out of their own land. You notice in the beginning of chapter number 7, of course, Jeroboam is not mentioned specifically. So this is definitely a little bit, little bit of dishonest, a little bit of dishonesty introduced here, but definitely some truth. God, Amos did say that God was going to judge by the sword. What Amaziah doesn't say is that God will have mercy as well. But anyways, going on, of course, he writes to the king. But then in verse number 12, he can't stop there. It's not just getting Jeroboam kicked out of the, excuse me, Amos kicked out of the country, but he has to say something to Amos personally. Now, he might have sent a letter to Jeroboam, but he wants to say his piece. He wants to vent and be angry at Amos in person. It can't just be through a, through a long-distance communication. Verse number 12, Also Amaziah saith, said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, flee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. So now we see a little bit of snobbishness here coming out. It is, oh, Amos, my country preacher, go back home and preach to the sheep. Go back home and preach down there, down to those people. Go back to your people. Stay out of my country. He goes on and says, but prophesy not again anymore at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel and it is the king's court. He says, Amos, you have no jurisdiction here. This is the king's chapel, the king's house. Now, interesting. Look at this just for a moment. For a priest, this should be disturbing to say, to claim that the house of God in Bethel is controlled entirely by the political realm. Amaziah, what are you thinking? You are putting yourself and the entire, the entire system of worship underneath a political authority. That should be a problem to him, but it isn't. I think it's very telling, though. He's indicating that, you know what, this is not God's house. There are many so-called religious circles, religious churches, even those somewhat close to us, that are not controlled by God. They're simply controlled by men and by social systems. I think it's a great concern for us to remember that our church, our, what we believe should never be based upon one man or one woman's perceptions, opinions, or anything else. Instead, it needs to be based upon God alone. You know, what would have made more sense for Amaziah to say is maybe disagree with the interpretation. Maybe say, you know, you're disrespecting God's house. But he's being very honest here. He's saying, you're disrespecting the king's court and the king's chapel. Not God's chapel, the king's chapel. Well, anyways, this is, of course, the resistance. He wrote to the king. He spoke to Amos. He told him to flee away to go somewhere else to preach to some lower class people. Don't preach to the king's people, because the king's people know better. You have no jurisdiction here. But now let's look at Am Amos' response. We've, of course, already seen the beautiful symbol of God's love, but we've also seen the promise of coming judgment. Now he's going to narrow his focus of his judgmental passage to one man and his family. 
He says, I spoke already of Israel, that God will, of course, save Israel, and God will punish Israel. But now let me come down to this one individual, the highest priest in Bethel. And let me tell you what God has to say to him. Verse number 14, Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. It's interesting that the first thing he says is, let me tell you my own authority. I don't come from the kingdom of Jerusalem. I don't come to you in my own authority. Most of us, when we get attacked, when it comes down to our credentials, what's the first thing you do? You defend your credentials. If you're like me. Most people are that way. Oh, you think you know more than me. Let me tell you what I know. Let me tell you my experience. Not Amos. He does the direct opposite. He says, I'm a nobody. Nobody at all. It says here, it says, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son. This, of course, has a couple different meanings. Of course, we have the idea that he was not a prophet by, by trade or by training. A prophet's son here in this passage has a couple of meanings. It could mean someone that was a literal son of a prophet. Back where I used to come from, we had a famous a saying that was used frequently. We would say someone who was mama called and daddy sent. That was usually a rather harsh um, criticism of a preacher. And one that was usually used to try to dissuade people from listening to someone. But there is an element of truth to it. Every once in a while, there's someone that is called by somebody else. Maybe by, in some denominations, by financial reasons, as we see in certain, well, I won't use any specific, well, the Catholic Church is a classic example. Throughout history, most of, your, most of the most well, well-funded religious leaders have been Catholic back in the Middle Ages. But we also find in other areas that it's a different denomination. In certain demographics of our country, certain types of religious figures get paid very well. Because that's not my motivation. We also see in other areas that it's, it is handed down from one individual to another. Maybe it's voted on. Maybe it's something else. But we understand sometimes people are called by themselves. Sometimes they are called by their mamas and sent by their daddies. And sometimes it's simply for some other reason. That's one motivation. Amos says, that's not me. Nobody wanted me to be a prophet. I'm not a prophet's son. It's not my area of expertise. Also, we see there's another meaning behind a prophet's son. In the Old Testament, it's also many times referred to someone who was in training to be a prophet, not just a biological son of a prophet. He says, that wasn't me either. I'm a nobody. Nobody wanted me to be a prophet. Nobody took the time to train me to be a prophet. He says, I have no say of myself. I have no authority. But let me go on. He says, and the Lord took me as I followed the flock. He says, my message is not my own. I am not here because I'm really good with my words. I'm not here because of my intellect. I'm not here because of my training. I'm not here because of my lineage. I'm here for one reason, because God took me. He says, my message is not my own. I can't defend my message based on my credentials. I can only defend it based upon God's word. We find Paul does a similar, similar approach in the New Testament. He says, I could defend based on my credentials. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, one of the smartest men of the New Testament, in my opinion. Of course, Apollos would be also up there, in my opinion, as well. But what did Paul say? He counted all these things as dung, as manure, completely worthless to anyone else. Why? Because the message of God is all that matters to true Christians. Yes, there are a lot of good tools you can use. There's a lot of good training you can use, but that matters nothing in the grand scheme of things. What really matters is whether we're saying what God said. So let's stop and take a break. Is your message that you give to others what God says or what you say? Is it what society suggests or is it what God says? Amos says, my message is God's. I'm a nobody, but God has a message for you. Now he goes on and says in verse number 16, we're going to see the specific judgment on Amaziah and his family. It says, Now therefore, hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Israel, house of Isaac. He says, you're trying to stop God's word going forth, so God has a specific curse for you. This is also repeated in the New Testament. Not this one particular, but God makes it clear that anyone who tries to prevent the spread of his word will receive the judgment of God. Verse number 17, For thus saith the Lord, 
thy wife shall be an harlot in the city. Now, this is a very hard message. It's one that most of us would not be comfortable talking about in any circumstance, let alone one in mixed company. But Amos says this is what is going to happen. This is not simply a grotesque imagery that we're given here. Rather, he's saying things are going to be so bad for your family that your wife is going to have to go to the oldest profession just to survive. That's how bad it'll be for you because you refuse to do your job. A rather harsh message, but we get the picture. It's not going to be pleasant for Amaziah. Moving on, the Bible says, And thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line. And thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. He says, your family is going to be destroyed because of you. They're so used to all the respect that comes from being the high priest of Bethel, but you're not the priest of God. Because you refuse to let the word of God go forth, you refuse to let the people, your own people, hear the message of God and the call to repentance. Because you're trying to make, as, God, as Jesus would say to the Pharisees, them a twofold child of hell. That's Jesus' words. Says Amaziah, that's what you're trying to do. And because of that, God will judge you. In fact, your family is so used to walking around and being everything, having the greatest of society, your wife is going to have a massive turn in her, in her world, so much so that she's going to have to take one of the least, the least respected jobs of all simply to survive. Your children will die because of your disobedience, and you'll have to see it, and you'll die in a polluted land. All the, well, the good food you're consuming now, all the things that you've had as luxuries so far will all go away because you refuse to accept the mercy of God. We see some, a very interesting chapter here. We, of course, see God's messages of judgment. We also see Amos' own pleads with God that God will hear and that even in the midst of judgment, God has forgiveness. We also see Amaziah's resistance. There is always resistance to the people of God. There is always resistance to the message of God and one of the areas where it comes from the strongest is usually from the religious crowd. There aren't very many atheists out there who are stopping you from going, visit, going and talking to people about Christ. There are some, but not many. You know who most of the resistance comes from? Other Christians or people who pretend to be religious. Those who claim that they worship God and therefore they're offended that you even think that they need Jesus Christ. God says, that's normal, but don't worry. I won't let that stop my word. It says, yes, those people will eventually be punished too, but they still have the opportunity of forgiveness. Recall, of course, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Spent so much of his early life dedicated to destroying Christianity, and yet God still forgave him and gave him the chance to come back and spread God's word as well. God always gives a message of mercy with his message of judgment. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your goodness and your love to us. Lord, we thank you for the fact, even the lesson from the plumb line, the fact that you truly have, that your punishment, your judgment is judicious, that it isn't simply indiscriminate upon all, but Lord, we understand that you give mercy and forgiveness, and your judgment is simply to bring us back to your standard. Lord, we ask you to please help us today, draw us closer to you, help us to encourage your message to go forth rather than discourage it. We ask this all in your son's precious name. Amen.